Hali Do, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native culture, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And I hope you'll do me a favor. Feel free to like and share these episodes. I so appreciate it. Yakuki. Big news, y'all. One of my favorite Choctaw authors, Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer, has a writing course called Fiction Writing American Indians. Now, this course will show you how to discover the insight you need to write quality, authentic stories. You'll also learn practical approaches to researching Native cultures and get answers to hard questions. I'll be taking the same course, and I invite you to take it with me. Just go to AmericanIndians.FictionCourses.com. Dot com. But don't forget to use the code CHOCKTALK, that's C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K, when you go to checkout to get $30 off. Yes, let's do this. We're back with the final episode of this series on Dr. William Meadows' book, The First Code Talkers. Today, we'll go into detail about additional tribes we haven't covered so far we hear so much about the Choctaw and the Navajo code talkers, but not much about the other tribes. What are some of the tribes we'll discuss today? Uh, some of the others that served in World War I uh, will be the Osage uh, from Oklahoma, uh, the Comanche from Oklahoma, um, some Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin, uh, the Oklahoma Cherokee, and then uh, some Suyan groups uh, up in the Northern Plains. All right, I'm excited to learn more. Again, I, I feel like I know so much about the Choctaw and the Navajo. There are other groups in here that definitely need to be highlighted. There's not a lot known about these tribes' contributions, but they are, of course, deserving of mentions of what you have found. So let's start with the Osage. Okay. Uh, yes, the Osage is a group that we know very, very little about. Um, there is um, a mention of quite a few Osage in Company M of the 103rd uh, Infantry Regiment, and that, of course, is also in the 36th uh, Infantry Division. Uh, majority are from Oklahoma, of course, and, and uh, there is overall uh, around 100 um, Osage that served in World War I, not all in the same group necessarily, but in total, uh, right around 100 Osage veterans in World War I. See, I wonder how many of our listeners actually know that. Now, probably people from the Osage tribe know that, but I don't think that's always been well known amongst folks like me. So tell us about the interview with non-Native private Alfonso Bulls, who was a veteran in the 36th. Okay. Uh, yeah, Bulls' uh, uh, material that was recorded from him is one of the more valuable sources we have. Um, so Bulls reported um, in his statement, um, the ones in my company were mainly the Osage. Uh, they used our telephones and they talk in the Osage language. Uh, we used to wonder if the Germans could ever uh, intercept those calls. Um, so the context of this um, is that he and another veteran, non-native veteran, uh, were had had been asked to speak at some schools uh, following the war and everything. And at one point, some of their material was written down and put into a uh, a published work and everything. So they were eyewitnesses and participants in the company. And he also describes um, uh, several of the Osage at that time uh, of being quite wealthy um, and having oil money and using, um, you know, their their oil money on kind of. You know, they had extra spending money when they were in, in uh, camp and everything. Um, also, he, he describes them frequently using uh, war hoops, if you will, uh, both in, uh, you know, field exercises and practices and then later in the war. And um, the uh, apprehension, they mentioned that, that the German apprehension about fighting Native Americans, they were aware of it. And the... Uh, uh, American admiration of their combat service. And so, you know, they, they're they reflecting after the war, of course, uh, but several positive things about the Osage veterans. And then uh, he also notes, uh, describes on one occasion, 
uh, while they had downtime and, and uh, everything, uh, they would do wa uh, war dances right there in the camp. I don't know if you've ever heard an Indian war hoop, but it's a cross between a scream and a yelp. Absolutely. And with that war hoop scenario, some non-Native soldiers didn't like the sound of it, right? Yeah, I, I think they were uh, uh, they were caught off guard, maybe a little culture shock or something. But uh, yeah, he stated that when the non-Native soldiers uh, would complain to an officer, the officer uh, told them that the Native soldiers were, were just letting off steam. It was nothing um, you know, serious and everything. And they should bide their time. Um, and then uh, the officer told him, you know, wait till we get to France. You'll see they'll be the best ones we have. Um, yeah. And, you know, that pretty much turned out in everything. Um, they were described as being, you know, very effective, very great soldiers when they went into the Champagne sector. Um, and frequently this is where the war hoops come up again. But uh, they jump out of those foxholes screaming those war hoops and yelling in the Cherokee and the Choctaw and all those languages. I think the Germans were scared to death of them. Um, I remember this one officer we captured was petrified. That would be terrifying, especially if you've never heard that before. And when you're in battle, very interesting. You note that several yeah. Osage were taken from Carlisle Indian School and inducted into the U.S. Army and then served in artillery and infantry units where they spoke to one another on telephones um, to relate information about incoming sounds. Something I appreciated about your book is that you sought to present highly researched and vetted information, even if it meant changing the course of what many assumed to be true based on years of false information. And August Choto is one such story, right? Yes, there, there are some um, <clears throat> some problems that have come up in the in the larger process of um, the code talker recognition and everything. And so around 2012, um, the Osage Nation was contacted by the Department of Defense, who was in charge of the recognition, um, informed them that Augustus Choteau was a code talker in World War I. And so the identification is problematic. And again, this is not to, um, um, not to disparage the, the Osage in any way and everything, but there's records that just simply show that there's been some kind of mistake made. Um, there is a photo, uh, and I found this in a like a World War One yearbook. Uh, there's a photo and a summary of uh, Private Augustus Choteau's military service, and what it shows is that he, yeah, he was in service. Uh, he went to Texas uh, during World War One, uh, but he was never sent overseas. And while at one of the camps in Texas, um, he contracted influenza, uh, which of course was going around. Uh, followed by pneumonia and uh, resulted in his death in uh, December 11th of uh, 1919. Um, so he did not go overseas is uh, the main point. And so there's been you know some kind of mistake there. Uh, so he couldn't have been a, a code talker and, and the identification. Um, I have no knowledge basis of it was what what it was based on or anything of that nature. Um, and so uh, so far, he is the only officially uh, identified Osage uh, code talker. Um, and one, there was one uh, congressional silver uh, medal made for the family and, of course, a gold medal for the uh, uh, tribe and presented to uh, his granddaughter. Uh, but, of course, he has a brother. And I think this is where the um, possibly, uh, we, we can't say for sure, but possibly where the mistake has occurred. Um, his brother, Charlie Choteau, did go overseas, did see action uh, in the Champagne and Meuse-Argonne campaigns. And uh, um, so he, he was in the right place at the right time when this kind of service was going on. However, again, we don't have anything specifically indicating that he actually did, but um, that could be the basis of the error. And your book doesn't say so, but in your personal opinion, do you think the Department of Defense could have mistakenly stated it was Augustus who did the code talking when it could have actually been Charlie? Uh, yeah, it, it's possible. Um, the uh, The biggest um, problem that I have 
uh, scene is that, um, and I found this out many years after the act, after it was all said and done, but um, the DOD had somebody pull files to make sure that the people that were vetted as code talkers were in service. Um, okay. But they did not go beyond that. So they didn't actually check to see if they were sent overseas, what units they were in, et cetera. Okay. And again, much respect to anyone who served our country. We appreciate the code talkers of the Osage Nation for their bravery and for the use of their language in code talking during World War I. I've always been an admirer of the Comanche. So I was looking forward to learning about what you discovered in your research about the Comanche code talkers. What regiment were they in? Uh, the Comanche, there were five of them, and they were in the 357th Infantry Regiment uh, in the 90th Infantry Division, which, like the 36th, the 90th was half out of Oklahoma and half out of Texas. And okay. uh, there are at least, at least 62 Comanches that served uh, throughout World War One. And your book states an article titled The Indian Sign, 1940, described their use in World War I. A.C. Monahan, director of the Indian Service, has received a War Department request to recommend 30 Comanche Indians for work in the Signal Corps. They would be sent to Atlanta, Georgia for training as Army telephone operators. Headquarters discovered that the Germans had tapped our telephone wires from advanced outposts at the front. Instead of laying new lines, the Signal Corps sent Comanches to man the instruments. The Comanches have no written language and they are not more than 30 white men. The Comanches have no written language and there are not more than 30 white men who can understand their spoken language. When the Germans heard the Indians talking on the Western Front, they naturally assumed, after exhausting all their foreign language experts, that the code was being used. Their code experts were called in and worked hard on the problem, but these two gave up in despair. They never did discover what the Comanches were chatting about. And I think it's interesting that, according to your book, they were especially recruited because they had no written language. Your book states around 1,000 Oklahoma Native Americans were brought to Camp Travis in 1917. Many had attended Native boarding schools and included some accomplished athletes, and they even participated in a circus in Kews, Germany. Those who had poor English or were illiterate were placed beside those who could interpret orders for them. English schools were developed for Mexicans, Native Americans, and some whites. So tell us more about their regiment. They were known as the uh, Texas Oklahoma, or uh, the nickname Tough Hombres Division. So the T for Texas and the O for Oklahoma, of course. Uh -huh. um, the three eighth was sometimes referred to um, as an Oklahoma Indian regiment, again, because it had such high native numbers within that regiment. Uh, mm -hmm. wasn't totally native, but very high, very high numbers. Uh, the 357th participated in more uh, engagements than any of the other in the 90th uh, Division. Uh, they suffered um, approximately 7,549 casualties uh, with 1,091 killed in action and 6,458 wounded in action. Wow. And yes, it was a uh, quite, quite a diverse uh, uh, makeup of the ethnicities of the people making up the regiment. Wow. Brave souls. Tell us about the Nakwadis. Um, Albert Nakwadi Sr., uh, who served in World War I, uh, told his son, Albert Jr., uh, that he and other uh, used their native language during World War I. And I found this out while I was interviewing uh, Albert Jr. Uh, in the 1990s for my uh, project on the Comanche Code Talkers of World War II. Um, and uh, reportedly an officer overheard them uh, speaking to one another in Comanche and uh, to cite in an artillery uh, piece and everything. And so there's some indication that it was used uh, in that method to, to convey artillery calls, uh, but there's also some other instances where it was used to call for relief and help uh, when a group was uh, surrounded.
Uh, Albert served in the uh, St. Mihiel and Argonne uh, forest sectors. And he himself, he was wounded. He was gassed, and, uh, but survived the war and, and was discharged in May of 19. So tell us something interesting about this father and son duo. Albert Sr., of course, was in World War I. Albert Jr. was in World War II. Uh, they both served as code talkers. Uh, however, the World War, World War I group did not receive formal training to develop a code, while the World War II group did uh, with the Comanches. And so Albert Jr., um, he did train with the Comanches uh, to develop the code in World War II, uh, but he was one of three individuals who did not go over, ended up not going overseas. Another Comanche code talker to take note of was Calvin Achevit, who was with the 90th Division. Now, Robert Achevit was Calvin's nephew, and they were really close. What did he say about his uncle Calvin? Uh, yes, I, I was able to meet Robert Achevit and do an interview with him a few years back. And uh, he spent a lot of time with his uncle um, at his home there on West Cash Creek. And he remembers visiting his uncle uh, at the creek there. Uh, they would take hikes and walks together along the creek. And he recalls his uncle um, using a walking stick uh, due to a uh, wound uh, in his hip. And uh, this wound, I do not think was actually uh, recorded. There's another one in which he is a, uh, receives an award for. Um, mm -hmm. But this wound, Calvin sustained the wound while on an assignment, uh, laying wire and cutting enemy barbed wire and communication lines in no man's land. Uh, during the time, he becomes separated from the group, got into a skirmish, uh, was wounded, and uh, but returned after a few days with a German prisoner. So he was missing in action for a bit, but then re reappeared with the German prisoner. Uh, he also reported that an officer had the idea to use the Comanche language to send messages over landlines that the Germans were tapping uh, after overhearing the men talking uh, to one another. So we have a father-son duo, and then we have an uncle and nephew duo who are clearly crushing it. Calvin Achevit was awarded the War Cross by the Belgian government for his code talking and was presented with the Distinguished Service Cross in September 1919 at the Oklahoma State Fair. Including Nakwadi and Achevit, there are five total Comanches that have been recognized as code talkers. Who were the other three? Uh, the others were uh, George Clark, uh, Gilbert uh, Potty Conwoop, and Samuel Tabitosevit. Um, all had been drafted uh, into the military service. And then, of course, there was uh, Achevit and then uh, Nakwadi made up the five individuals. Um, the best information we have from the group, uh, we have the account from uh, Albert Nakwadi Jr. of what his father told him. And then there is a newspaper clipping uh, from 1919 that shows uh, Calvin Achevit and talks about him receiving his two awards. Uh, hmm. The Belgian War Cross was awarded to him actually for code talking uh, in a situation where a group of the 90th were surrounded by Germans and cut off for a while and he was able to get messages through for relief and, and use Comanche to do that. Uh, his Distinguished Service uh, Cross uh, came for uh, in a, in a uh, fight he was shot severely through the arm, disabling that arm. And with one uh, one good arm, he took his rifle and managed to kill uh, another German soldier and then capture a German soldier and wow. uh, bring him back. And so that's two, two awards that he was awarded. And there's a picture of him uh, uh, wearing those in 1919 and then later photographs, of course, after that. But the newspaper article specifically states it was for using the Comanche language, you know. The 357th Regiment served 68 days under fire. During two campaigns, the units the Comanche served experienced heavy machine gun and artillery fire, gas, and hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but they never failed to reach their objectives. The 90th returned to the United States and was deactivated in June 1919. Ura Comanche, for your service.
We talked in an earlier episode about how the first code talkers weren't the Navajo, and surprisingly, they also weren't the Choctaw. But in fact, which tribe, Dr. Meadows? Uh, actually, yeah, this is something that um, myself included was surprised not once, but twice as I went along <laughs> in my research. But to date, the early, earliest date that we know for a group actually using a code or using a language as a code um, is the uh, the Ho Chunk, or popularly known as the Winnebago, uh, from Wisconsin, and uh, there were 29 uh, Ho Chunk or Winnebago from that um, respective community that went in World War One, and only two of them uh, that we know of actually uh, did this language um, uh, service and everything, mm. and so they were uh, pulled together, and the earliest date that we can say for sure. Uh, is in June of 1918, um, and the way we know this is the the uh, uh, the two gentlemen we'll talk about in a moment, um, Robert um, Robert Big Thunder and uh, John Longtail. Um, they were uh, using code in Chateau Thierry in in the summer of uh, 1918, and uh, Big Thunder was was wounded severely enough in that fight that he had to be pulled out of service and was put in a uh, hospital and then sent back to the States. Well, during this time, he wrote uh, a letter uh, to his father explaining what he had been doing, what happened, etc. And he mentions in the letter specifically them using the language uh, hmm. to send messages. Wow. And that letter ended up, a uh, version of that letter ended up getting published in the Carlisle Indian School newspaper. Huh. Uh, also in 1919. So we have a firsthand account from the gentleman himself uh, that experienced it. And of course, after that, they were both wounded. Um, but after that, um, but so we can't say how early they started it, but we know it's no later than that specific day that he was wounded in, in June of 18. So hmm. to date, uh, we only we only have uh, fixed dates for three of the seven groups in World War One, but at present, the Ho Chunk are now uh, the first one to use it. But again, in, in my just in my opinion, it's not really a matter of who's first. It's a matter of of getting them recognition. All of them, you know. Absolutely. And my hats off to you, Ho Chunk people. Speaking of, the Ho Chunk are a Siouan speaking tribe entailing two tribes that are federally recognized the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska and the Ho Chunk Nation of Wisconsin. They originally hailed from the areas of Minnesota, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa. Your book says, like so many Indians in the war, these men were used for scouts, snipers, and telephone operators, and during their seven weeks in the frontline trenches had many interesting and exciting experiences. So who were the two Ho-Chunk you mentioned in your book that served as code talkers in World War I? Um, first would be Private John H. Longtail, uh, who uh, was from Winnebago, Nebraska. And then Private First Class Robert Big Thunder, uh, who came from Wittenberg, uh, Wisconsin. And um, there's a there's a couple sources that say that they were cousins and things. But um, Robert Big Thunder's daughter told me they were actually brothers in law. Uh, so John Longtail okay. married uh, Robert Big Thunder's sister. So they were brothers in law and went into service together. In your book, you share about the letter Big Thunder wrote to his father in late June of 1918, which appeared in the Southern Workman. I was wounded last Friday, June 21st at five o'clock in the morning. We made a rapid rain. We made a rapid raid on the Germans early that morning at three o'clock and chased them off a big hill. Our raid was very successful. A piece of bursting shrapnel hit me below my left eye, cutting my skin and went through my nose. I shall be well again, but am afraid my left eye will be very weak. After being wounded, I ran all the way from the front to the first aid dressing station under heavy artillery fire, but was lucky and was not hit by anything. Thank God I was not killed. I wish I was home working on the farm, but this is our duty and we must fight it to a finish. Then we can come home. Some Germans were up in the trees, shooting down on us, and hand grenades coming over and bursting close to us hit some of our boys, hurting them bad. 
I was with one boy who could shoot well, and he shot down one of the Germans in the tree. One machine gun was only about eight yards from us, but they couldn't see us. I was behind four little trees together and shooting. We chased them quite a ways, and then I was wounded. Fascinating. So what else do you know about Longtail and Big Thunder? Wounded at Chateau Thierry, um, and Longtail was awarded a Purple Heart. Um, both went over the top three times, uh, which are these large rushes where you know you leave your trenches, go up over, and, and try to take the position in front of you. Uh, they also withstood three attacks uh, from the enemy. Um, they were mentioned as being able, as scouts, to go out and get information, return safely. Um, where many uh, other non-Indians would fail. And, of course, they uh, excelled in transmitting uh, telephone messages in their own language. And uh, uh, I wish we had more information. We, we do have their Indian service cards uh, from the National Archives, which also uh, mention um, that they used the native, the, the native Indian code or language uh, for sending messages. So we actually have three independent mm -hmm. uh, verifying sources from the period, you know. Something that surprised me, though, was that several World War II Ho-Chunk veterans were included in the Code Talker Recognition Act of 2008, but Longtail and Big Thunder were not. They, they simply, that information hadn't come to light uh, yet, and they were unknown at that time. And oh, okay. uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember where I, I came across. I may have just been I may have just been looking through the uh, uh, the Carlisle Indian School newspaper when I hit that article, uh, but yes, they they do qualify for recognition under the Act. Um, the Act is an open Act, in other words, it has no closing door or window. So as mm -hmm. long as information can be um, brought forward and examined, they are eligible to apply. Um, and I'm trying to get um, I'm trying to get people interested in seeking that recognition now. Um, oh, that's and great. Trying to, yeah, trying to make new contacts up with the DOD to move this forward. It sounds like they definitely deserve it. So I hope they'll receive the recognition that they deserved. I'm sorry to say to our Oklahoma Cherokee friends that there's not a lot of records on the Cherokee Code Talkers of World War I. However, what can you tell us about them? Uh, you're, you're right. There is very little data, but we do have some from the period. And so uh, there were Oklahoma Cherokees. Um, now this is distinct from the Eastern Band of Cherokees who also do some, some code talking in World War I. Um, and the Eastern Band were in the 30th uh, Division, whereas the Oklahoma Cherokees were in the 36th. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is, uh, this is the same, same company, Company E, uh, that the uh, eight Choctaw code talkers come from and everything. Uh, they were used in the Meuse Argonne and at Forest Firm. And the two sources that we um, have that are most uh, reliable is um, they are mentioned, both the Choctaw and the Cherokee are mentioned in one report about Forest Firm uh, from the period in the 36 records. And then we also have a photograph of George Adair um, in Emmett Starr's, uh, who is a Cherokee historian, uh, in Emmett Starr's book that came out in 1926 and underneath his service picture, um, it mentions that he um, used his language and he was actually a cook and was pulled off the line and used for his uh, language. So bravo to George Adair as well. Wado to the brave Oklahoma Cherokee who served in World War I. You mentioned the Suen groups in your book. The Germans were wiretapping and as they did, Two unspecified Sioux men were assigned as telephone operators. There was a private named Paul Picotti, a Yankton Sioux who asserted that Indian telephone operators won the war single-handedly. He stated, you'll never see it in the histories. That world war was ended by the Indian boys who were in the service because eventually they were put up to the front and they talked Indian and then later was transferred to Indians in the commanding officer's quarters. And the world war came to an end. So that's a big statement. and I like his take on the situation. <laughs> We've mentioned along the way that there's been some misinformation about the code talkers and over time with extensive research like yours, more data has come to light to correct some of these.
inconsistencies. And again, that's not to dismiss the sacrifice of those in the service. However, not all those who were deemed as code talkers were actually code talkers. Here's another such story involving the Standing Rock Lakota. Tell us about that. We'll be back after this quick break. Are you in the medical field looking for your next opportunity? Listeners, I'm proud to introduce you to Native American veteran-owned staffing company, Worldwide Medical Staffing. Owner and CEO Jackson Weaver is a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and is a service-connected disabled veteran where he and his team staff for commercial healthcare and government entities, such as the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and DHS, and specialize in staffing Indian Health and VA hospitals nationwide. Isn't it nice to know that our veterans are being cared for by staff who have been handpicked by a veteran who's been in the staffing business for 17 years? Healthcare job seekers, check out these open jobs on www.medical.com. If you're seeking temporary, long-term, or permanent placement of physicians, advanced practice, registered nurses, and more, check out www.medical.com and Diyako Ki to our medical professionals and to those who have served our country. Uh, uh, yeah, this, this is, this is uh, one group that we found some, some problems with me and also a Lakota uh, friend of mine. Uh, uh, we're one uh, veterans as code talkers, uh, mm -hmm. including Albert Grass, Richard Blue Earth, uh, Joseph Jordan, Tom Rogers, and Joe Younghawk. Um, all 45 were awarded medals through the uh, Code Talker uh, Recognition Act of 2008. There were issues with these gentlemen being termed as Code Talkers. How so? The biggest, the biggest issue is there are three or four separate articles from 1918-1919 that report that Sioux, you know, which is a, a blanket term for many groups up in that way, but that Sioux were used, uh, you know, in, in, in sending messages in their language. However, none of the articles ever specify a unit, uh, nor do they name an individual. So I have no doubt that there were some used, um, but pinpointing it has been a real difficulty. So what I began to do, um, this is a, a really large number of people from a single group um, uh, to be used for this type of tactic, which was really in its infancy and everything. Like we say, the, the Choctaws used eight, and uh, uh, all these groups were very small at the time. Um, so it, it, it creates several problems here. One, it's unlikely in terms of military structure. Um, code talkers were really spread out and everything. They weren't really clumped together in, in tight units or anything of that nature. Um, mm -hmm. The second, it assumes that all these men were fluent speakers at that time of both Lakota and English. And again, that's probably not realistic of the era. We had some uh, natives who were, of course, very fluent speakers, but spoke very little English at the time. And then mm. we had others in some cases which were, you know, fairly acculturated, spoke a lot of English, but not necessarily that much of the native language. So it makes that assumption. Um, and, you know, we know that there were there were natives that relied on others to translate for them. We know that there are some natives which were dismissed from service uh, from a lack of English and everything. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a very, very large number uh, for this and everything. Uh, but what I began to do then is, uh, is eventually um, uh, check, their, check their records to compare this because normally you would have a code talker, say, at each company. So you, you wouldn't necessarily uh, need that many um, and again, the records that were turned in, they don't tie these men to any specific unit or assignment or anything. So it, it's very, very complicated. In the book, you state that as an example, the Choctaw used, say, eight men. And even in World War II, the Navajo often used only six to eight men per regiment. So it sounds like the 45 code talkers that they mentioned were involved would have comparatively been a tremendous amount. How do you think they came up with 45? I asked a gentleman who who was involved in this process, 
And I asked him, how did he come up with this number? And he said, well, I, I went to all the uh, cemeteries in the reservation. I wrote down all the headstones of, of uh, Lakotas who served in World War I, and I vetted them and turned them in. And I said, well, what, what information did you have uh, that they actually were code talkers? And, and he didn't. Um, he just assumed mm -hmm. if they were in World War I, they were fluent speakers and they were used as code talkers. Well, that's, that's a big leap of faith, of course, because yeah. um, there were natives, non-natives that served in every role in the in the service at the time, you know. Um, right. Um, so I began to pull pull their actual records and check them. Um, and so I, I found close to very close to 20. So it's not, you know, close to half, but not quite half of uh, the men from Standing Rock um, who were reported as code talkers and, and recognized as such, um, but were never in the right locations to serve as code talkers. Mm. And uh, what I mean by this, there's at least 18 that remained in stateside locations throughout the war. Uh, they were hospitalized, some of them. Some were discharged for medical issues prior to going overseas. Uh, there's some that, that stated in their exit interviews they saw no combat while overseas or, or were not in the front lines, etc. cetera. Um, there's an individual that was discharged two weeks into basic training for flat feet. Um, there's an individual that didn't even join the military until 1920, which is well uh -huh. after World War I. Uh, but these are all in here. So there was one individual, for example, that um, uh, did not even join the armed forces until 1920. So that there's, oh, wow. they're not a World War I veteran and, and there's no way they could have been um, served this. Um, there's some others. Again, um, John Redbean, Joseph Two Bears, Louis Bighorn Elk, uh, Frank Young Bear. Uh, they arrived overseas very, very late in the war. Uh, so I'm not saying they couldn't be, but it really needs to be checked uh, because they may have got there so late that they didn't actually see, you know, see action. But again, um, we have the records um, for the North Dakota uh, segment of Standing Rock and uh, but the South uh, South Dakota sector of Standing Rock. All those gentlemen have not uh, been pulled together yet. Uh, so, like I say, just just checking the pool I had, I found at least eighteen out of forty five that did not um, uh, did not match up and everything. Um, Albert Grass and Richard Blue Earth are two individuals that are uh, claimed to have done code talking. Um, they both were were killed in action in nineteen eighteen, and then uh, uh, there's another individual, Harry Lean Elk, died of pneumonia in June of nineteen eighteen and may not have seen combat. A lot of the American troops were really getting into the very last of the war, you know. Right. And again, those would, that's going to take some serious records to check those. It's not, it's no, no discredit to these men. They all did their service and what they were ordered and assigned to do. It's nothing about these men at all. Uh, but I think it's, it's a, uh, uh, there's errors in the, in the vetting process and the um, records checking that led to this uh, situation. Another thing that, that sticks out is that in the Wanamaker surveys, uh, there are quite a few Lakotas who are, who are visited with, and not one of them make any mention of uh, using the language or anything of that nature. Uh, hmm. So like I say, I have no doubt that some of them did, but I just don't think it's as big a number as, as uh, has been uh, told. And the Wanamaker survey was clearly aware of code talking because they uh, interviewed some of the Choctaws and the uh, officers in the 36 specifically about that very topic at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. So, like I said, there's a lot of lot of um, of uh, errors there, but the records were not really checked. Yeah, well, and it's it's such a sensitive topic and their time in the service is still honorable. They honored our country. They honored our families. So let's talk about the First Nation peoples, the Canadian Armed Forces. They also tried the idea of code talkers as well, correct? What We only have a couple mentions I've ever run across, but it was said that it was, uh, it was examined, but it, it was not really uh, pursued by them. Uh, although it will be in World War II, 
two later, but there's very little, very little mention or data on uh, uh, the use of uh, Canadian languages that, that I've been able to uncover so far. Okay. And then you've also looked into the Cheyenne as co-talkers, correct? There are a source or two that do mention that Cheyenne were used. And this, again, is a really uh, difficult uh, piece of research so far uh, for everybody, you know, not, not just myself. Um, mm -hmm. But there is, there is a possibility. Um, there were Northern Cheyenne from Montana who served in the 40th Division in World War I. So there is that possibility there that there might have been some use for that. But again, we don't have anything specifying, you know, which Cheyenne or, or where, you know, they were used or anything of that nature. Um, there was, for example, with the Choctaw Code Talkers, there was a lieutenant in um, the 142nd named Temple Black and who was a Southern Cheyenne and uh he, he was the individual that was put in charge of organizing the training after Forest Firm of getting 18 men and three non-commissioned officers and doing a week of training. However, it didn't involve the use of the Cheyenne language, and, and he was just an officer. You know, So I don't know if there's uh, possibly confusion with that. Um, in 2017, the, the, the uh, um, Southern Cheyenne, Oklahoma, contacted me and asked me if I knew of any individuals, Cheyennes, that had been code talkers. And I said, no, I, I do not have a single name or have never been able to uncover anything definitive. And, you know, have you? And they said, no, we haven't either, you know. Hmm. Um, so uh, to date, I, I have not been, uh, again, I'm not saying that it didn't happen. I, I just have run across no uh, information that's led anywhere on this and everything. And so, um, uh, they weren't initially in the original group with the uh, code talkers recognition, but have been added in, you know, as a, as a uh, recognition as the Cheyenne Arapaho in October of uh, uh, 2017 and everything. So okay. that's another one where we, we, we've got um, a statement and an assumption, but, you know, to my knowledge and theirs, just nothing has panned out. Hmm. And how about the Ka? including Moses or Mose Belmard. Yeah, this is a this is another interesting. Uh, Mose was one of the last hereditary uh, call chiefs and um, he joined the uh, army in 1915. He became a first lieutenant in uh, June of 16. And uh, there is one source it's it's well after the fact though. It's well after um, uh, the war uh, that credits him with originating the use of of Indian language and coding and everything like that. And, um, but again, there's, uh, um, it, there's a, a, a statement that says he was promoted to the rank of captain for his suggestion. But again, um, there's no indication that he was in the, the right place at the right time or um, that there were other call that were used or anything of that nature. And a lot of this uh, came out in some of the, uh, like some of the obituaries after he had passed and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, you know, just not real clear and everything. Yeah. And uh, he was, quite, he was quite older at this time too. So um, he may have been one of the uh, officers that was, you know, reassigned uh, before they went into combat and everything. But uh, I have not found other than that mention of him. And uh, he was an officer. And as far as I know, did a, did a, you know, super job and everything, but I just have not been able to find anything uh, really firsthand that indicates that, you know, so it's a, it's a gray area. Yeah. Sounds like it. And more to come hopefully over the years, but poor Mose, he had an interesting welcome back home. Your book says he was reportedly severely mm -hmm. gassed and in the confusion, he was transferred to a medical mm -hmm. facility some distance from his unit and was believed dead for several days. Returning to the United States to recuperate, he saved the news of his return as a surprise, only to walk in on his own funeral feast and ceremony in the Ka community. What a welcome. <laughs> now, this information yeah. was, was actually, de now this information was actually classified, but it was declassified recently, right? 
uh, well, it, it, it got published. I don't know that it was technically classified, but it, it came to light publicly. Yeah. So on July 12th of 2010, um, Oklahoma Senator Jim uh, Inhofe uh, entered in the congressional record a um, section titled Remembering Code Talker Mose Belmard, uh, which recognized Captain Mose Belmard as the originator of the code talking. Um, but again, a website contains a picture of Captain Horner and five of the Choctaw code talkers in, in Company oh, no. E, um, mistakenly labeled Mose Belmard and other members of the World War I code talkers. So mm -hmm. I don't know how that came about, but the, the, uh, the confusion with the picture is clear. We know who, who those individuals are. And uh, again, it's just one of those things we don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have a lot of direction on this. We have a claim made by somebody and, and uh, you know, of course they're wanting to, and like I said, his service was fine and wanting to recognize him, but really just almost no way to support this, you know. That story though, about his attending his own funeral was very interesting. You mentioned yeah. groups that have World War I marked on their Congressional Code Talker medals, Cheyenne, Cheyenne River Sioux, Crow Creek Sioux, Mohawk Pawnee, Ponca, Sac and Fox, Tribe of the Mississippi and Iowa, Meskwaki Nation, Santee Sioux, Standing Rock Sioux, Yankton Sioux, but virtually no sources or names of individuals have been made public. In some cases, an individual is purported to have been a code talker and may have been, but no actual evidence is provided. Do you assume over time more information may come forward, such as Moe's, where in 2010 his information was published? Um, yes, it's possible. And um, the other the other thing that would have been primary again is uh, if each individual their their actual military service record was run um, and checked, then you would have um, you would have dates, you would have places, you would have um, what their MOS or military occupational specialty was, and there's a lot of different ways you could narrow down uh, if if it was even possible that they did this work, but yeah. that's a, that's a daunting, daunting task and, and would take a lot of, uh, I've ran some of them, uh, but you know, by no means could I run all of them. And yes. again, for some groups, we don't have a name. Right. So it, it's quite possible though. Uh, because, um, like I always say, until the, until the, the military records in the national archives are digitized, it will always be a needle in a haystack, you know. Mm -hmm. Chapter six of your book focuses on the period since World War II. Over the years, there has been a renewed interest in their service and ensuring they are honored as well. The book goes into greater detail about these honors, such as the Code Talker Bridges that have been dedicated throughout Oklahoma to Choctaw Code Talkers, which I have uh, haven't seen all of the bridges, but I've taken a a few pictures of some of them. And then there's so much more that I don't have time to cover in this episode. But Dr. Meadows, you were highly instrumental in ensuring code talkers or their descendants of code talkers would be honored at the gold and silver congressional medal ceremonies in Washington, DC in 2013. Actually, let's just take a moment for that. Why don't you share with us how you were able to initiate these medals and this event? Well, I, first thing I want to say is that there are many, many, many people involved in this. It, it wasn't just me by any means or anything. Um, I think my my role was uh, I was kind of called in as the the one academic that deals with this kind of subject and uh, had access to several code talkers already and could could provide some records and things on certain groups, not all of them, of course. Sure. Um, but yeah, there were many, many tribes and many people involved. So the way that I really got um, involved with this was um, in 2002, my Comanche Code Talkers of World War II book came out. And uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in it, a lot of grassroots interest, you know, people in, you know, interested in if, if their tribes had Code Talkers or things. And then um, I think it was in the spring of 2004. Yeah, I had just, uh, I don't even think I'd been here a whole year at Missouri State. And I got a phone call from Senator Tom Daschle's office. 
and uh, asking me, uh, they wanted to have a Senate uh, committee hearing on the uh, contributions of Native American code talkers in the U.S. Armed Forces, I believe was the title. Asked me, you know, could I come up and, and uh, present any and all information I have on all code talking groups? And, you know, it was clear uh, uh, the Navajo had already been recognized and they, they were interested in, you know, non-Navajo groups and everything. Uh, so I said, sure. So I went up there and uh, I'll never forget that day. It was the same day the National Museum of the American Indian opened. Oh, so wow. uh, the uh, Senate meeting was in the morning. And right after that, everybody walked down the uh, hill uh, for the uh, opening of the of the museum and everything. Um, but uh, basically, I was there. Um, uh, Chief Pyle was on my left from the Choctaw Nation. Uh, Melvin Kirchie Jr. was on my right from the Comanche Nation. And then there were other members that were Ho-Chunk and Lakota. And um, there were some Choctaws there and, and other uh, people. Um, but basically, I was given 15 minutes to make my statement. And, um, and then we also had a written statement that we submitted. And then any records or things like that, we submitted in paper as well. And um, I remember, um, you know, part of it, I remember I had my eyes closed as I was speaking. I was just concentrating. But it was, it was for me, it was the calmest um calmest thing I've ever done I think I've been nervous in situations where I had 10 people but for some reason that day uh it just it was just smooth as silk you know and so mm. I testified my, my piece and I remember Ben Nighthorse Campbell said well what do you think should be done to recognize these individuals and I said well wouldn't take up a lot of room but I said you know there's that one there's that one Vietnam statue there close to the wall and it's just three guys. And I said, but I think there ought to be a statue up here on the mall for Native American code talkers, you know? And he says, well, you know, it takes a lot to get that done. I said, yeah, but it's an awful big mall. You've got a lot of room up here, you know, and <laughs> he chuckled, you know, but uh, that, that was my, that was my two cents, you know, um, <laughs> but it, um, after that day, the phone never quit ringing even to this day, uh, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly, I get inquiries from different tribes, families, uh, uh, students, everything from like history day projects to college people and thesis and dissertations, um, tribes, like I said, museums, the military, different branches of the military, um, scholars and people from Europe, like, you know, uh, France, Germany, Poland, um, England, Australia. Uh, those are the main countries and everything. But um, it's just always had a lot of interest. So my testimony, I was kind of like the academic you know, person. And then we had people from the tribes that actually had the code talkers. And that together was overwhelming evidence in their opinion. And so legislation got started. And of course, it took four years to, to get it through. And wow. there was lobbying. Uh, yeah, there was lobbying and things of that nature. And I remember once in a while, I would get, I, I would get uh, like, ask again, what do you have on this group? Or what do you, and so I would respond, you know, whatever I had at the time. And, um, and you know, I had worked on all the groups that I have now then, you know, I'd worked on mm -hmm. a few. Um, so some of the things that I know now came, you know, after that, of course. Um, but that was basically mine. But but again, I want to make it clear that I, I was just, you know, I was just one. I was one piece of lettuce in the salad. So, you know, <laughs> pretty big and, piece. But it of was lettuce, a big salad. So everyone always anytime <laughs> I've had questions about co talkers, yeah. people always push me back to you. So I am amazed at what you and others were able to accomplish. And it must have taken a lot of time and commitment and effort. So bravo. These heroes returned home. And even as they were considered heroes in war, life after war continued on as normal, even in some unfavorable ways. How so? Um, well, li relatively little changed in government Native American relations Um on an everyday basis and everything. 
and the views that natives held about uh, or non-natives held about indigenous people did not radically change. Wow. Um, yes, there was, there was a lot, lot of, of uh, positive press about the excellent service of native soldiers and, and some of their uh, heroism and things of that nature. Um, but, you know, as soon as they went back home, they were still going back to largely you know, fairly impoverished communities and, and um, a hard scrabble on a daily basis, uh, you know, for life. And that's really not going to, a lot of that's really not going to change that much until World War II, you know. Okay. Um, some were no longer physically able to perform uh, strenuous labor that they had before the war. So that then created a situation where if they're not able to work, then again, their future is a little precarious, you know. And um, so we do have some struggling with uh, finding a way to, uh, a means to survive, you know, um, mm -hmm. and relying on relatives and things of that nature. Um, some were forced to sell their land allotments and seek work um, in the Indian service uh, or in other trades and industry. Um, a lot of them went home and just simply were farm, you know, farmers or farm hands. Um, several worked in log, uh, log mills, saw mills and things of that nature. Um, there, there's some that did quite well, like Otis Leader. Um, Otis, of course, had some education. Um, he got on with the highway department in, in Oklahoma and had, had a very solid career and everything of that nature, you know, but uh, for the average person, you know, it was still going to be uh, fairly tough after World War One, you know, and, wow. um, um, so, you know, some were wounded and disabled. Um, there was a lot of re reduction of federal funds in the 20s, uh, things like that, that helping uh, that that uh, did not help, you know, that hurt them and everything. Um, and so a lot of people went to really, uh, diminished levels of medical and educational services. And of course, as you know, the, um, the Miriam report, you know, came out in 1938. Um, and that's what would really drive the Indian Reorganization Act in, uh, in 34. But it basically found that the last 70 years of the reservation experience was, it had put native people, uh, the vast majority of them in a subpar level uh, compared to national standards in any field, in health, um, nutrition, education, sanitation, housing, you know, the whole, uh, the whole kit and caboodle. And uh, that's what these gentlemen were going back home to was that uh, very, uh, you know, meager situation. Uh, on the other hand, of course, they're resilient people and have been, you know, for a very, very long time. So people did what they needed to do to, uh, uh, to survive. So big gardens, there were people still hunting and fishing and like jo Joseph Oklahoma, he was always fishing uh, and bringing home uh, game that way and things. So people did what they, you know, what they did. Um, but there was not a lot of service and, and things like that uh, for coming back as a veteran. So. Hmm. It's always surprising, isn't it? But on the other hand, you state in your book that military service prompted the revival of numerous songs, dances, men's warrior society rituals, naming ceremonies, and gift giving, giveaway ceremonies to honor individuals. It sounds like even with all the research you've done and all you've accomplished, you're still not slowing down. What else are you working on? Um... Well, just this last year in 2023, um, I had a expanded book chapter on uh, natives in the U.S. Armed Forces came out. Um, uh, it, it was a book designed uh, uh, diversity in the in the U.S. Armed Forces, and it was designed mostly for officers to read because the nature of who they're commanding now is so diverse. And so mm -hmm. there's a chapter uh, like I, I did the chapter on Native Americans, but there's you know, one on Hispanic cultures, uh, African Americans, uh, Asian Americans, so forth and so on. Um, and that was an earlier chapter, but we were allowed to add quite a bit of length into it and expand that. So that came out. Um, also last year, I had a paper on a, uh, 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 relates to the Comanche Indian Veterans Association and the revival of a traditional status there, Pukotsi uh, status, which was their contrary warriors back in the pre-reservation days. 
And so they, they wanted to revive that and they thought, well, what would be the equivalent? That, that will never be the same today. The army will not let you go out in front of the line and shoot an arrow through your sash and, you know, and, and uh, right. fight in place. Uh, but what's the equivalent of that in heroism? And so they decided it would be the people who were awarded for like something with valor. So like a bronze star with a V cluster or a hmm. silver star or a distinguished service cross or something like that, an air medal with a V. Um, and so there's been 30, I believe 30 individuals of that. So I did a paper uh, paper on that group that I've been working with real uh, closely and uh, I'm working right now on a on a second paper on the Comanche Indian Veterans Association uh, relating in, in how that organization as a whole helps returning veterans with PTSD. Uh-huh. And so I've got a lot of really uh, a lot of the guys have really opened up to me and shared their their intimate uh, struggles, um, both in combat in service after coming home and then how joining that group and what they do has, has helped them and everything. Um, I have in just a month or two, I have a paper coming out on the, um, uh, the Kiowa warrior women. And so it is, uh, right in your home area there. Um, it is a group of, uh, of, of female Kiowa veterans, uh, who have formed their own color guard. And so they're bringing in the cool. colors at, at, at powwows, uh, in different parades, sovereignty events, um, cultural events, et cetera. And it's the first one, to my knowledge, to start in Oklahoma. Uh, mm-hmm. There are others up in the Northern Plains. And since, um, since they have started, they've been very well received on an intertribal basis. And um, it has uh, prompted, uh, I'm, I'm hearing a couple other women's veterans groups to start forming and everything in Oklahoma. Um, and then, oh gosh, I don't know. I have a lot of irons in the, in, in the fire and everything. Uh, I, um, yes, you do. <laughs> uh, just a couple of years ago, I was uh, asked to uh, become the historian for the Comanche Indian Veteran Association. And uh, I was at a meeting with them. And, and of course, I've known some of these guys for a long time. And and some of them, their dads were the code talkers that I interviewed, you know. And uh, But I asked them, um, I said, you know, I just want to get two things clear with you guys. And I said, well, first of all, you know I'm not a Comanche. And they they kind of chuckled. And they said, yeah, we're aware of that, you know. And <laughs> I said, well, the second thing is I'm also, I'm also not a veteran. I, you know, come from a big family of veterans, but I, I didn't get to to do that, um, medical things. And and uh, George Red Elk, he laughed. He said, yeah, but that don't matter either. You're with us now. I'm the historian for the group. So I manage all the records and document stuff and file it away. And then anytime there is a, a, a veteran funeral or a flag going to be flown at, a, at an event or anything of that nature, um, they'll let me know who they need. And, and I'll pull the files and compile the the uh, stuff and um, and send that to them so uh, to facilitate any kind of programs, you know, and things like that. And um, that. I'm right now I'm, I'm serving on the, uh, I'm a board member at the uh, um, uh, American Indian Center of Springfield here in Springfield, Missouri. And um, so I, um, years ago, I ran powwow at, at MSU. And so we went together, we do our powwow jointly now, and I'm serving on their board. Um, so that's been really uh, rewarding to see that Indian Center hit the ground running and, and really grow and prosper. It's so many programs and, and things that it's just really going well. And um, um, so we have been doing some uh, educational events with Wonders of Wildlife up here, both for school ch- children as well as the public and um, stuff at MSU. And so it's just wonderful. But and I could go on, but anyway, yeah, I, I've I've got a um, I've got a stove that has a lot of extra burners on it uh, for all my projects, so I keep busy. So, absolutely, you do. There, every time I talk to you, there's something new you're working on. I don't know how you do it all. Do you think there'll be a Code Talkers of World War II book? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I've I've made big headway on it. Um, OU Press keeps asking me when I'm going to finish it because they want it. Um, I've still got, I have projects that are, are finished and in front of that. So I'm trying to get those off the stove, so to speak. 
and get those published and out and done so that I can go back and really finish that one. Um, yeah. And I have a, a, a handful of groups I need to do a little bit more research on. Um, you know, I also, I have a whole nother uh, World War II group that hasn't been recognized and I have quite a chapter written on them. Oh, well, that is keeping Multiple. me on my toes. I look forward to that. Multiple firsthand accounts and, and, uh, you know, good, oh. good evidence. No question. No question. They did what they did, you know, and uh, they're just totally, totally off the radar. People don't know about them. You know. Well, thanks for all you're doing in that realm. It's an honor for our veterans as well as their families and the rest of us as U S citizens can certainly be proud as we close. Why don't you read to us the last few lines of your book, which I think are lovely and so fitting. Okay. Yeah. My pleasure. Um, <clears throat> for many, Native American code talkers are an intriguing human interest story. Emerging from the cultural and linguistic suppression of boarding schools, Native Americans willingly used their native languages during the World War I to defend their tribal lands and peoples when called upon to do so. That they did this despite government efforts to eradicate their native languages and cultures and for went seeking recognition for doing so should serve as a lesson in cultural preservation, cultural perseverance, grace, dignity, cultural pride, and patriotism. Yet perhaps the greatest legacy left by the Native American code talkers is the immense pride they instilled in their respective native communities. Using perhaps the simplest and most human of expressions, language, their obscurity provided a valuable weapon. More than a century after their unique service in the Great War, Native American code talkers have become iconic figures and an important part of many intersecting cultures and histories. We owe them a profound debt of gratitude. Amen to that. Indeed, we do. Listeners, I highly recommend you get a copy of The First Code Talkers by Dr. William Meadows on Amazon and many other places you buy books. I bought mine at the FAM bookstore in Oklahoma City. There's so much more in the book that I wasn't able to cover, so check it out. And of course, it makes a great gift. Dr. Meadows, before we go, are there any words of wisdom you'd like to share with our listeners? Sit down with your people. Turn the phone off and sit down with your people and talk and record things and get them down. It, it doesn't matter what culture you come from. Um, that stuff's precious and it's all limited, you know. And um, the other thing I would say is, you know, don't don't be afraid to meet new groups, new areas. Uh, you know, my thanks, you know, Yakoki to the Choctaw Nation. And, and everybody else that I've worked with and everything. But um, I always tell students, if, you, if you're willing to put the time in, you're sincere, you're upfront, people are willing to teach you. That's, that's really what it just takes is, is uh, uh, patience and um, uh, straightforwardness. And, and people are happy to teach you about their cultures and, and learn about them. So don't be afraid to, to talk to people and ask questions and explore, you know. I love that so much. Very well said. Our brave servicemen and women deserve our respect and our praise. Our code talkers spoke the language of their forefathers, the language they were told to never speak again, and used it to defend our freedom. They truly were the warriors of which their ancestors would be proud. Dr. Meadows, thank you again for your time and for researching our great code talkers, Yakoki. Oh, thank you. It's my, my privilege, and I thank all of you. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yako Ki. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>